Welcome to Midnight on 7 Star, the channel that helps you make sense of military history and military technology. Please stay with me till the end, because it's very difficult to find other videos that discuss the same stuff that we discuss here. You're all familiar with the large American supercarriers. They are majestic, they're imposing, they're iconic symbols of the American power. Today, we're not talking about them. We are talking about the so-called light carriers. The light carrier is currently the most common type of carrier in the world, but to find what it is, well, it's difficult. The supercarrier is built with a single purpose, to operate the planes on board and put them in the condition of doing, well, what they normally do. A light carrier, on the contrary, may have many, many different missions. While well, it surely operates the air wing on board, but it may also have facilities to support amphibious assaults. It can be a command center for an expeditionary force, or it can coordinate humanitarian relief operations. However, the key element to tell a light carrier from a conventional carrier, in my opinion, is the type of aircraft composing the carrier air wing. The carrier is light if it doesn't operate conventional takeoff planes, but it operates only jump jets, and its air wing is not composed exclusively by helicopters. So basically the condition to be a light cover is jump jets only, and maybe some helicopters, but not all helicopters. There are obviously other ways to classify the carriers based on their technology and whatever, but now we stick to this definition. And if you don't agree, well, let me know in the comment below, we can discuss this. So according to this definition, the American supercarriers are definitely not light. All the Russian-derived designs, like the Chinese or the Indians, are not liked either, even if they are way less capable than the similarly sized American carriers. The French Charles de Gaulle, well, is not a light carrier, it has catapults, even if it is half the size of the American supercarriers. Maybe an appropriate term could be a midget supercarrier? The new British design of the Queen Elizabeth class is light by choice. In the sense it has a sky jump, could in principle operate conventional takeoff planes, but they don't. Actually, one day the composition of the air wing could be different and they would not qualify as light carriers anymore. The two Australian Canberra class are not light carriers because they operate only helicopters. And uh, the same is true for the Thai carrier, yes, Thailand has a carrier, which is called Chakri Narubet. I hope, since when the jets on board, the Harriers were retired a few decades ago. On the contrary, the American Wasp class amphibious assault ships in the US Navy can be classified as light carriers. Actually, the Marines have plans to use them as aircraft carriers in case of necessity, and there is an ongoing debate in the United States if it isn't the case of replacing some of the super carriers with these lighter and obviously cheaper ships. The Italian Cavour and the Spanish Juan Carlos designs are definitely light carriers. The future Japanese ships will be modified for the F-35B, so they will be light carriers. The future South Korean flat top, it will probably be a light carrier as well. While there are also various other countries that operate ships that could be classified as light carriers if a squadron of jump jets was acquired and made operational. But the point is, how could a small carrier be really relevant? Can the small air wing that these ships do operate make really any difference? Well, there is a precedent. On April 2nd, 1982, Argentine invaded the Falkland Islands. Uh, probably they invaded the second because if they did on the 1st of April, nobody would have taken them seriously. The following day, the British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher met the first Sea Lord, Sir Henry Leach. At the time a diplomatic solution was still expected, but the Prime Minister wanted a show of force anyway. I want a task group near the Falklands within three days. I'm sorry it can't be done, Prime Minister. You can say that to a Prime Minister, why it can't be done? 
because it takes at least three weeks at full steam to reach the Falklands, I'm afraid, Prime Minister. I see, we'll do it as soon as possible, and I want to send the Ark Royal. I'm sorry, but it can't be done, Prime Minister. You keep saying that, you should not say that, I can't be done to Prime Minister, what would be the problem then? Prime Minister, you ordered the commission the Ark Royal three years ago. The British task force was based on two light carriers, Hermes and Invisible, together with a hastily adapted transport ship. Then they embarked 28 Sea Hires FRS-1 and 10 Hire GR-3. It was a small air wing of relatively low performance jets operating at the end of an extremely tenuous logistic line, but it still was capable of inflicting just enough damage to the Argentinian Air Force and the Argentinian Naval Aviation to tilt the air superiority over the islands slightly in favor of the British. Two or three more ships damaged or sunk, and the whole conflict could have gone in an entirely different way. The lesson learned at the Falklands was that even a small air coverage is an order of magnitude better than no air coverage. However, one critical shortcoming of the light carriers also emerged the lack of long-range airborne radars for air surveillance. This became painfully, painfully evident when the HMS Sheffield, deployed as a radar surveillance outpost to protect the Hermes, was sunk by an Exos-8 missile that it never saw coming. So the task of light aircraft carrier is deploying a small air group to provide air support and coverage in the context of a blue water or an amphibious operation. Drawing upon the Falklands experience, modern light carriers also deploy airborne early warning systems based on helicopters that can provide at least an intermittent radar coverage. In this context, the F-35B is a game changer. For the first time, light carriers can deploy basically the same planes as their larger siblings. The F-35B has a slight performance penalty and an operational range estimated to be about 20% shorter on average if compared to the F-35A or C, but the system and the capabilities are the same. Compared to the Harrier, it's a quantum leap forward. Let's make an example. A ship like the Italian Cavour, the only platform that as of 2020 can support the F-35B outside the United States and the Great Britain, could be a good example. It could deploy a squadron of a dozen F-35B supported by AH-101 uh, airborne and warning helicopters for, and some NH-90 for the um, ship anti-submarine defense and for search and rescue. The ship could probably sustain around 1820 F-35 sorties daily for several weeks and obviously the local condition and the logistics may change this number quite considerably but for the sake of argument let's say that the ship could operate in ideal conditions. Now 20 F-35 sorties a day is a lot considering the effectiveness of the F-35 itself. 20 sorties a day is potentially enough to establish the air superiority against the majority of the world air forces that have no more than one or two squadrons of relatively modern fighters. 20 sorties, it is enough to close the access to a strait or a waterway, stopping the commercial traffic even in the face of some opposition. 20 sorties is enough to protect a large convoy from almost all the world air forces but the strongest ones. The adoption of the F-35B has delivered to the light carrier's capabilities much closer than before to those of the super carriers. And this is the key point of this video. We will have more and more countries with the capability to project air power at long distance than ever before. A light carrier equipped with the F-35 Bees can now change the geopolitical balance in a region in a way that is similar to what the American supercarriers already do today. You know that I'm not soft with the F-35, my doubts about the sovereign control of the platform and the lack of diversity that is happening in the Western Air Forces are still there. 
However, I must admit that the B version is a game changer and it has started a trend that is not going to disappear anytime soon. So if you like this video, I am sure you will like the videos that are going to appear on the screen right now. Uh, in the meanwhile, please like, dislike, subscribe and hit the bell so you won't miss anything. And if you could consider supporting the channel on Subscribestar or Patreon, that would be amazing. In the meanwhile, thank you very, very much for watching. See you in the next video.